Hey folks, this week we're going back into the archives and rebroadcasting episode two, my conversation with Dr. Gary Klein, because this is one of our most requested episodes. Gary is the father of naturalistic decision-making, creator of one of my favorite red teaming tools, pre-mortem analysis. We had a great conversation about leading and decision-making in times of great complexity like we find ourselves in today. So have a listen. I think you'll enjoy it. Welcome to The Thinking Leader, brought to you by Red Team Thinking. Bad leaders react, good leaders plan, and great leaders think. Each week, you'll get new ideas and insights from business executives, military experts, and innovative thought leaders to help you lead more effectively and better navigate your complex world. Now, here are your hosts, best-selling business author and top-rated leadership speaker, Bryce Hoffman, and former RAF Wing Commander and Business Agility Coach, Marcus Dimbleby. Hello, and welcome to The Thinking Leader. My guest today is Dr. Gary Klein. Gary is a cognitive psychologist and one of the world's leading experts on human decision-making. He's the creator of one of my favorite red teaming tools, too pre-mortem analysis. Gary's also the author of a number of great books, including Sources of Power, How People Make Decisions, and Seeing What Others Don't, The Remarkable Ways We Gain Insights. Gary pioneered the naturalistic decision-making movement, and he is the president of Shadowbox. Gary, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for inviting me, Bryce. I appreciate it. You know, you've written so many great books and revealed so much through your research about how we as individuals, as humans, make decisions. And a lot of it has focused on this idea of naturalistic decision making. What is naturalistic decision making and what does it reveal about how we make decisions as people? All right. So we didn't set out to start a new paradigm. That wasn't our goal. We were just pursuing a simple question, which is, how do people make tough decisions under time pressure and uncertainty? And we had gotten a contract from the Army. It's a very small contract, a six-month effort. And the Army needed to know how do people make tough decisions, life and death decisions under time pressure and uncertainty. So we said, okay, well, uh, we'll investigate it. Now, the typical way you would do the research is you would take a laboratory task and you'd vary the time pressure and you'd vary the uncertainty and see what the result was. And that would be a well-controlled set of studies. And we didn't want to do that because we didn't know how do people actually made decisions under time pressure and uncertainty. And we said, instead of going to the laboratory, let's study some people who do it for a living. And we chose firefighters because they regularly have to make life and death decisions under those kinds of conditions. And we had a hypothesis because all the laboratory research had suggested that there is a way to make decisions. You, you set up a matrix, you lay out all your options on one axis, and then you lay out the evaluation dimensions on the other, and you see which option comes out with the highest score across the different dimensions. But we knew that firefighters, we didn't think they had enough time to do that. So we didn't think they, they were generating lots and lots of options, maybe just two. So we had that hypothesis. And then we started to study them and ask them how they made decisions. So naturalistic decision-making is looking at, at how people really make decisions in natural settings where there are all these kinds of conditions that they're faced with. And these are conditions that you can't set up in a laboratory. You can't have people making life and death decisions. You can't have people working with um, multiple agencies and multiple teams and subteams and all of those complications that the firefighters faced. So that's what naturalistic decision making is. You know, it's so interesting. I think the first book of yours I read was Sources of Power. And you talk in there a lot about the research that you did with fire chiefs and in fire stations. And I was a journalist for 22 years. And in my early career, I spent as a cub reporter, a lot of time going to accident scenes and fires and other emergencies. And I was always stunned by the way that good leaders were able to make really tough decisions without even appearing to pause to do exactly. so. Exactly. Exactly. What did you uncover in your work about how they're able to do that? 
We started talking with them and observing them, sleeping in fire stations, riding with them, and trying to find out how do they make decisions. And each one would tell us, oh, we never make decisions. I remember the first interview I ever did with a commander. He looked at me and he said, Gary, I've been a firefighter for 16 years. I've been a commander for, for 12 of those years. I don't think I've ever made a single decision. And we had just gotten funded. He was the first one I interviewed. And we just gotten funded to find out how firefighters made decisions. He said he never made decisions. And I said, well, how do you know what to do? And he said, it's procedures. You just follow procedures. It's really very straightforward. And I was crushed because I just saw our whole project failing. We were just a disaster. And I said, okay, before I leave, can I see the procedure manual? I figured maybe I could find out something by looking at it. And he said, oh, it's not written down. You just know. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, maybe there is something here after all. And so we had, we kept hearing again and again that people didn't make decisions. And what they meant by that is they never wrestled with comparing one option to another the way they were supposed to. It was really about trusting their gut, right? Exactly. Using their intuition. And I was always uncomfortable about using the term intuition until I started working with the Marines who were very comfortable with using it because they know how important it is. So then we had two things we had to figure out. One, how could they be so confident that the first option they thought of was going to be a good one? And then the second mystery we had to solve was if they're only generating one option and getting ready to go with it, how do they evaluate it except by comparing it to others to see which is better? So we did about 30 interviews and asking highly experienced firefighters about tough cases, not average routine cases, but about some of their toughest ones. And what we found was with the years of experience they had, they had built up an experience base, a set of prototypes. So when they looked at a situation, they quickly said, oh, it's this type of situation they quickly developed their awareness of what was going on, which told them what to pay attention to so that their attention was nicely directed, told them what they could expect if their matching, their pattern matching was right. And so that allowed them to be smooth because they knew what was likely to develop next. And if their expectancy was violated, it was a wake-up call. Maybe something else is going on that I hadn't thought of. Their pattern match told them what were the appropriate goals, so they knew what they should be trying to do. Now, you think firefighters would have an obvious goal, put out the fire, but it wasn't obvious because they're pulling up to an address. They don't even know if it's the right address. Somebody might have phoned in the, the wrong address. So they're looking around for smoke or other kinds of signs. They pull up to the building or, or the home that's on fire, and then they've got to decide, what do they do about it? Maybe there are people inside. If, if that's true, you don't want to work on putting out the fire. You want to do search and rescue and get them out. Or if there's nobody inside, maybe you want to put it out. Or maybe it's too far gone and you're going to need to call in another alarm. And maybe you're not going to be able to save it, but you want to make sure it doesn't spread to the next house, which is right next to it. So the goals are critical. What am I trying to achieve? And the pattern match also told them, Here's the most likely course of action that's going to work here. So within a few seconds, they immediately had a plausible course of action. And that's what 10, 15, 20 years of experience buys people. It buys them that ability to do quick pattern matching and know what they're supposed to do. And because they don't do it consciously and deliberately, it's intuitive, and so it feels mysterious, but it's really the way our experience pays off, the way our experience plays out for us. It seems like it's just kind of like a flash of inspiration, but really it's based on a lot of mental calculations that are going on that these folks are not even really aware of. Right. I wouldn't use the word calculations. Okay. I would just say that it's based on all the experience that they've compiled so far that the way our mental systems work, those experiences are organized so that we're ready to rapidly put a course of action into effect. It's like pattern recognition. It's, it's, yes. And as you said, if something doesn't fit the established pattern, that's a red flag to kind of stop and maybe reevaluate the situation. 
Right, exactly. Maybe maybe something else is going on that I haven't thought of. Uh, and so e- even, you know, as, as the, the fire operations would be proceeding, the firefighters would be looking for anomalies that mm-hmm. might might tip them in, in another direction. Now, the second mystery was, so your intuition is telling you what to do, but it could be wrong. So how do you evaluate that course of action, except by comparing it to another course of action? And when we went through our interview results, what we found was the way they're evaluating it is by imagining it. They were playing it through in their mind and saying, okay, if I do this, how's this going to play out? And uh, what could go wrong here? And they're just doing what we call mental simulation. So they're following that type of uh, an approach with the mental simulation. And that's extremely important because it means that they're not doing rote procedure following. They're also very sensitive to the context that they're in and to, to using that context to assess whether the dominant procedure is going to work. And if it, if it works fine, then they carry it out. If it almost works, then they um, find ways to improve it, to, to overcome the problems. And if they can't find any easy ways to overcome the problems, then they say, forget that. What else can I do? Can I give you an example? I'm going to use not a firefighting example, but an example that most people are, are very familiar with. It's the miracle on the Hudson. Yes. And it was about a decade ago. It was a U.S. air flight, takes off from LaGuardia. Chesley Sullenberger is the pilot. And uh, they, they take off. They're climbing. They're about to turn head left, heading west. And they hit a flock of geese. And within uh, a few seconds, their engines are out of commission and they don't have any source of power and they are essentially a glider, but not a very aerodynamic glider. And from when they hit the geese until he landed, it was about three and a half minutes. So Solenberger, as soon as that happens, his immediate reaction is, okay, um, I've got to go back to LaGuardia and get this on the ground. Of course, that's what they're all taught. If you have a, a, a problem as you're taking off, just return to the airport. So he contacts air traffic control. We've got an emergency, vector us back into LaGuardia. Air traffic control is working like a demon to try to get him back to LaGuardia. And Sullenberger is just thinking through What's going to happen is I turn left and do a go around and I, I'm losing altitude. And now there's a good chance I may crash in the middle of downtown Manhattan. Not an ideal circumstance. And the risk seems so frightening to him, so unacceptable, that he rejects that option. He does the mental simulation and it doesn't work. And so he calls air traffic controller who says, yeah, we've got your vector. And he said, yeah, we can't make it. We're heading west. What's in New Jersey? Teterboro. Can you vector us to Teterboro? So the air traffic controller is vectoring them to Teterboro because they're, they're heading west. And again, Solenberger does the mental simulation and realizes it's 12 miles away, 11 or 12 miles away. They're not going to make it. So he rejects that option. And now as he's heading west, he's sort of out of the corner of his eye looking at the Hudson River. And he's thinking, you really don't want to land an airplane in the middle of the Hudson River in January when it's so cold. But he was looking for the first option that had any chance of succeeding. That was the one that he chose. And because he was such a marvelous pilot and stayed so so cool under all of this pressure, managed to land the airplane and the tugboats came out and not a single passenger lost his or her life. So it was a a huge success story. But what did Solenberger not do? Solenberger did not set up a matrix and say, okay, here's my options. Back to LaGuardia, over to Teterboro, Hudson River. What did the evaluate? He didn't set up that kind of matrix. He was, you know, looking at options one at a time until he found one that would work. And that's the one that he chose. And so that's the model we have of decision-making. It's a two-part model. The first part is the pattern matching. And that's the one that feels like intuition. And the second part is 
doing due diligence, doing the mental simulation. And that's done consciously and deliberately, also drawing on your experience to see, is this option likely to succeed? This is so fascinating because behind this is what you said early in, in the conversation, that when you talk to people like this, they're not often aware that they're doing all of this calculus, that they're, that they're doing all of this pattern matching, that they're running out these scenarios in their mind. It's, it's all kind of being done at an unconscious or automatic level, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you look at this, there's an obvious leap that one could make saying, you know, trust your gut. But how do you also combat then against things like optimism bias and things where people overestimate their ability to trust their gut? How do you square that formula in figuring out how to make decisions in your own life or in your own capacity as a leader? Right. So, and people often ask me that exact question. And am I advocating that? When should people trust their intuition? And my answer is never, because our intuition <laughs> may it may be wrong. That's why we use the mental simulation part to think about it and think about it deliberately and see in this situation, in this context, is it likely to succeed or are there negative consequences? For Sullenberger, listening to the transcript of his conversation with air traffic control, it took him about 30 or 40 seconds as the air traffic controller was trying to get him back to LaGuardia. And he said, nah, I can't make it. Sullenberger didn't, you know, get on the intercom with the passengers saying, does anybody have a really good calculator? Because I've got to figure <laughs> out what's my sink rate and how much altitude am I going to lose for each? I mean, he didn't have time to do that, but he wasn't just trusting his gut because the first impulse was the one that he'd been trained with, return to the airport that you took off from. But he wasn't just going with that first impulse. He was imagining it and using his experience to quickly determine this is a, probably going to be a losing proposition and it's just too risky. Well, the thing I think that's fascinating about that story too in that example is that not only did he not follow his first instinct, he didn't just trust his gut when his gut told him that's not going to work, let's go to Teterboro. He, as you described, he then played out that simulation in his mind. Right. And realized that wasn't going to work either. Right. And so what he was not doing was satisficing. He wasn't coming up with the first available option and then powering ahead, you know, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. <laughs> well, and, no, yeah. I would disagree with you, Brian. Okay. You, <laughs> okay. Sure. I think, I think what he was doing was satisficing. He was looking for the first option that he thought had a, a decent chance of succeeding. He was doing that. He just was, he was not committing to a course of action until he was sure that, that he had found one that had a reasonable chance of succeeding. I mean, he, he wasn't all that confident about landing an airplane on the Hudson River in January. All it takes is a, a little puff of air and a, a little wave to catch one of his wingtips. And now he doesn't have a nice level landing. <laughs> He's gone cartwheeling. So he wasn't crazy about that option. But he had gone through all the other options, and th this is the first one that seemed to him to have a ghost of a chance. I see. But the point is, is that he continued to kind of test these out. Right. He didn't right. just jump forward when an idea occurred to him. He wasn't impulsive at all. Exactly. No. We've been talking about some very kind of high life or death stakes decisions made in very short amount of times by people like fire chiefs and aircraft pilots. But I think that... This is something that comes into play for leaders at times like this, when, when they're dealing with an unexpected crisis that kind of changes everything for them. There is a tendency on the part of some people to be impulsive, to react, and to scramble. And I'm wondering what advice, you know, based on your years of analyzing decision-making, would you give to leaders at times like this in times of crisis about what the right way to respond to a threat like a global pandemic that kind of upsets your entire business model, your entire plan is? What's the, what's the best way for a leader to approach something like this? Right. So I'll tell you, uh, I'll start out. I don't know that I have a, a good answer for that question, but I can answer the question, what's not a good approach to All this? All right, let's start with that. Yeah. <laughs> and what's not a good approach is to say, look, the stakes are so high, we have to 
carefully identify all the different options and all the different evaluation dimensions. And we have to just, you know, carefully work out what all the consequences are going to be. And only when we're 90% confident should we proceed because that's a recipe for paralysis. We're never going to be 90% confident. The firefighters have a saying, better the wrong decision than no decision at all. And with a crisis like the one we're experiencing now with COVID-19, there is so much complexity and there is so much uncertainty that to try to make sure that you, you can analytically identify the one best option and not to do anything until you've identified the one option that's demonstrably better than the others is a recipe for paralysis. Now, we know in decision-making research, that you can identify two different approaches. One is what's called, uh, some people call it tree felling. Like if you have some property and you want to cut down a tree, you know, you think about it, is this tree going to work? Is, is, is it old? Is it going to fall on, on my house? Okay, maybe I, I need to remove it. And you decide, um, okay, I'm going to remove it. And if you decide to remove it and you uh, have somebody come over with a chainsaw and they're halfway through, and you say, wait a second, I've changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's not going to work. So a tree felling decision is one where you make a commitment and you, you're in or you're not in. The other approach is something that's uh, hedge trimming. When you're trimming your hedges, you sort of have an idea of how you want to shape it. And as you're going along, you may modify it. You may change your plan. You may change some of your goals and you want to be able to adapt and be flexible. And I think what I would be looking for here is for more a hedge trimming strategy for people to generate courses of action, but to realize that they may learn things that challenge what some of their assumptions were. They may have to revise their plans. They have to expect to revise their plans. In fact, not only may they have to revise their plans, they may be revising their goals. They may be sure. changing their goals because we're dealing with wicked problems. And, rather, and instead of saying, I've got to nail down the goal before I start, they just should be expecting that as they go along, they're going to discover what plausible goals might be. And they can't rely, like the firefighters, they can't rely on patterns to say, well, here's what's worked in the past and it tells me what's a plausible goal because we're in a situation where that level of expertise doesn't exist. It's kind of a textbook example of what David Snowden with his Kniffen framework would call a complex problem. Exactly, yes. And as he talks about in that, that, the only thing you can do when you're dealing with a complex problem, which is, sounds exactly like what you're advocating here, Gary, is sense and react, mm -hmm. it is to recognize that you're not going to sit and draw out a roadmap that's going to get you through this. You're right. going to have to, to move forward cautiously with as much confidence as you can muster based on your current analysis, but recognizing that you're going to have to change course through this process as well. So let me, let me just respond to that. What you just said, Bryce, is not trivial because people like to identify a course of action and then firmly commit to it. Yes. And that makes them insensitive to anomalies and subtle cues that are early indicators that maybe they're going in a nonproductive direction. So rather than seeing people lock in and commit so that they can reduce all the anxiety they feel about, about making the decision, they should say, there's a good chance I'm going to have to adapt. I'm going to have to modify my plan and maybe even my goals. I want to be on the lookout for counter indicators. And even if people are, are telling me they have some different ideas than the ones that, are, that I'm holding, I don't want them to mess up my momentum but I don't want to silence them either. I want to make sure that they're still gathering evidence for their point of view and they can bring me that evidence as evidence arises so that I'm not blinkered. I'm not just proceeding on blindly. That's so important because it's about keeping an open mind and recognizing that, you, that you've never cracked the code, that you've never solved the problem entirely. And, and I think that one of the things that I think is so powerful about this idea, Gary, is that Times of crisis like this reveal how important that is and make it essential. But it's really important 
in any case, right? We're just not as painfully aware of how important it is in, <laughs> in, in normal quote unquote life, right? Yeah, we're not aware of it and we don't have global scrutiny on all of our <laughs> actions the way we do now. But it is essential. Now you can't, I mean, one, one response to uncertainty is hold back lots of resources. Yeah. But we don't have unlimited resources. So you can't play it that safe. You, you have to make some sort of commitment, but you also want to make sure that you're not locked in. And another thing that you want to be careful about is when, you know, as your people will say, well, here's an approach that has worked in the past and it looks reasonable here, but there's always going to be some difference between w where it worked in the past and what you're facing right now. And you want to be sensitive to what are the differences and what the implications might be? Because something that's worked in the past might simply be depending on resources you don't have or connections that have been broken or other kinds of disruptions. And so you, you don't want to just you know, mindlessly say, let's import a procedure from the past because it's worked then, so let, let's put it into play now. And oftentimes things that seem like valid historical analogies on the surface are not. I've worked with some leaders in, in the past month or so since this pandemic has become such a big issue who've kind of gone to the playbook that they, you know, said, right, let's do what we did in 2008, you know, and, <laughs> and maybe there's some validity to that, but things are shaping up already to be quite a bit different than the last financial crisis we had. And so you, you run the risk of thinking that you know how to respond to this when you're still, it's still not even clear what you're responding to fully. Mm -hmm. Very much. One of the techniques that we explore for, for situations like this is a method, our shadow box method, which is a method for having people see the world through the eyes of experts without the experts having to be there and constructing tough scenarios. And Shadowbox was developed by a firefighter, Neil Heinz, New York Fire Department, for novel situations uh, it was developed in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks so that firefighters and the commanders would have experience facing situations that they had never encountered before and would be forced to try to see what the implications were and what some of the, the driving factors were rather than simply plugging in procedures. Interesting. And how does that work? Okay, so you would create a range of scenarios that are relatively on target for, for the type of dilemma that you're facing. And then at critical points, you'd stop the action and say, okay, now um, at this point, Bryce, you've got three courses of action. Which one would you pick? And what's your rationale for picking it? And in our traditional work with Shadowbox, we also have a panel of experts who've gone through and they've done their ranking and written down their rationale. So you can compare your responses to that of the experts and you can also see what the experts' reasons were and compare them to yours. But in today's crisis where there's expertise from epidemiologists and, and, and others, but in terms of what to do with the global economy, the expertise is harder to earn. I think the best way to use shadow box would be not to convene a panel of experts, but to have the people who you're working with and your team each respond and then compare notes and see where you're calibrated and where you're not calibrated, just as a way of having people reduce the chance that there's a common ground breakdown, that they're, they're all sort of synced up in the way they're understanding the situation and the kinds of uh, dilemmas they're facing. That's interesting. And we'll put a link in the show notes to Shadowbox so people can learn more about that. There's Great. another tool that, that you've developed that I use a lot in my work and have found to be incredibly valuable in planning at any time, whether it's a time of crisis or just in any occasion. And that's pre-mortem analysis. Where did pre-mortem analysis come from? Right. We developed it in a company that I had in the late 80s. It was a research and development company. And we would do projects. Most of the projects were successes, but not all of them. We had some failures. And when the project fails, you do an after action review. You do, you know, you, you sort of assess. A postmortem. Uh, a postmortem, right. 
And at a certain point, I said, why don't we move this up? Why don't we do this at the beginning on the kickoff meeting? And so we tried it. And so that's why we called it a pre-mortem. Now, a post-mortem, everybody's familiar with a post-mortem. It comes from uh, the medical community. After a patient dies, you want to find out why. And you're conducting a, an autopsy and an inquiry. And hopefully you find out why the patient died. And then the physician knows. So that helps the physician get smarter. And the physician can compare that the notes with the family. So now the family finally learns why their loved one dies. And, and if it's something that, that's sort of unusual, you might write something up and put it in a medical journal so the community learns from it. So everybody benefits from a post-mortem. Everybody except the patient because the patient <laughs> except is the dead. Patient, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, let's do this up front as part of a kickoff meeting. And the, and, and the way the exercise works, there's several variations. And I like some of the variations that you've developed, Bryce. And the way we originally had it was... Uh, at the end of a kickoff meeting, we would say, okay, we're starting a new project. Everybody is all jazzed up. Everybody's enthusiastic. Now, let's take about 20 minutes here. Everybody just, we're all part of the team that's going to do this project. Just lean back. Just relax. We're going to do a little thought experiment and pretend that I'm looking in a crystal ball and I'm looking in a crystal ball and I see like six months later, whatever the appropriate amount of time is, three months later, down the road, oh my gosh, this is really ugly. What I'm seeing in the crystal ball is this project failed. The course of action that we picked didn't work out at all. It was a, a major disaster. The crystal ball isn't showing us why. It just shows us that this failed. Now, everybody around the table, Take two minutes and write down all the reasons you can think of for why this plan failed, starting now. And then I time them, and I, I really just give them two minutes. I just want the major issues that they can think of. And then we go around the room trying to identify what are the, the concerns that people identify. And Bryce, it's amazing the types of things that people say. And we've done research. We've done research with this, you know, if you just ask people after they come up with a plan, okay, does anybody have any critique, any problems? Nobody says a word. But with a pre-mortem, it's a contest to show that you can come up with a good problem that other people hadn't even thought of. Yeah, it really gets to this idea that, you know, when we, when we come up with a plan, and it can be something as simple as, you know, you, you decide you're going to buy a vacation house. And once you say, right, we're going to do this, you start thinking about how wonderful it will be, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, you start thinking about all the good things that are going to come from that. You don't tend to say, well, you know, what are we going to do if there's a plumbing leak, you know, and we're not there? What, what, <laughs> you know? And it's really interesting. You know, one of the first companies that, that I taught this technique to was an investment bank, a private equity company, actually. And one of their managing directors said, when we come up with an investment thesis, I love the way he put this. He says, we become pregnant with the deal. <laughs> we become pregnant with the deal <laughs> yes that's great and and he says it's you know an expectant mother isn't looking down at her belly saying boy you know what if my baby's ugly and, and <laughs> mentally deficient you know they're thinking about how wonderful it's going to be this little bundle of joy is coming and mm -hmm. he says when you become pregnant with the deal it becomes impossible to critique it yes Right. So the way the pre-mortem and working with it for a few decades now, the way it works is you don't ask people what could go wrong. You tell them this has failed. Yeah. So there's no ambiguity. You know that the plan has failed. And then the demand characteristic, like in, in a normal meeting, if you said, does anybody have any, see any problems? There's all kinds of demand characteristics not to raise troublesome issues, even sure. if you have any reservation. And most people don't because they're all pregnant with the idea, with the plan. They're all ready to get started. So nobody wants to raise those issues. Here, you, you reverse that dynamic. You say, show me how smart you are by the kinds of problems you can identify, the things you can anticipate that we haven't considered so far. And it really, I've seen it, it becomes a bit of a competition for people to show what they can identify or 
it also gives people permission to voice problems that they ordinarily would never have mentioned. It does. Frankly, it's a lot of fun too. I mean, we find when we, we do this with clients, this is one, one of their favorite exercises. And people, people really kind of do try to, to stretch their thinking to show how they can come up with, with something that no one else has thought of or that's something that's really creative. You know, as you mentioned, we give people a little bit more time. In fact, we often let them go home and come up with their failed state and then work back to the present day. And what we find is sometimes people come up with things that are really goofy, mm-hmm. you know, intentionally. And yet the steps that led to that failed, that crazy failed state that they imagine are often very poignant and very valuable that they reveal things that could happen that could lead to really bad outcomes. But they got there by stretching their mind to some of these crazy things. I mean, we, we had one client, one of the members of a, of a red team that was using this tool came back and, and his failed state was XYZ corporation destroys American democracy. When he put that up on the board the next day, everybody just kind of cracked up and rolled their eyes. It turned out that one of the steps that, you know, he worked backwards from there with like 12 different steps that led to that crazy failed state. One of those steps actually ended up happening. Oh. And not that it was going to lead to the subversion of American democracy, but it was, it was something that the company was actually prepared for because of this exercise, because they looked at that as a potential, a potential wow. failure point. And, wow. and it's really interesting that people come up with this stuff. We all have great fun with it. We've had people who literally present their failed state as a newspaper headline, like Wall Street mm-hmm. Journal, you know, two years from now, you know, <laughs> XYZ right. Corporation stock is down 50% and CEO Nick Armstrong is, you know, out on the street. And or, <laughs> we've even had people act out board meetings where there's kind of like, you know, a star chamber happening and the senior executives being interrogated for why this plan failed. And, and it just, it frees people's minds, right? To think differently. Mm-hmm. It disinhibits them. It encourages them to engage in speculative thinking. And often that speculative thinking is discouraged because it's seen as immature or, uh, you know, not necessarily a thing grownups do is that kind of imagining. But this is a, a license to imagine and to question some assumptions in ways that, that you just, just described. I've wondered what would have happened if people had used the pre-mortem in the early days of COVID-19, not just to say, here's a course of action, now let me do a pre-mortem on it, but in some situations where leaders were saying, I don't think we need to do anything. Well, okay, that's a course of action. Let's do a pre-mortem on that and see what some of the consequences might be. Yeah, and it's really interesting. I was having a conversation a few days ago with a friend of mine who served on the business roundtable for many years. And he pointed out to me that, you know, people say that, well, nobody could have seen this coming. He said the business roundtable had a respiratory virus spreading from China to the world through air travel (laughs) on their list of like the top 10 threats to the global economy for years. Fascinating. And the business roundtable advises presidents of of both parties and in the Bush administration, the Obama administration, this issue was raised and they took it very seriously. And they said that this was just kind of laughed at as something that wasn't happening. So why do we need to prepare for it? Mm -hmm. Right. And when I've studied these kinds of so-called black swan events that nobody predicted, almost every time you can find people who they didn't predict it but they imagined it. Yes. That there were people who were warning about it, but they either, they were ignored or they were sidelined or they were put in a position where they just weren't comfortable speaking out. You know, it's interesting. When I started work on on my book on on red teaming, one of the people that I met was uh, a nuclear inspector from Switzerland who had a company. He, He went around the world inspecting nuclear facilities and basically doing pre-mortems on them, you know, figuring out if there's a catastrophic failure at this plant, what is going to lead to it? And he had done one for Fukushima Mm. many years before the earthquake and tsunami. Mm -hmm. And I believe that he came up with 12 potential points of failure at Fukushima that could lead to a catastrophic nuclear accident occurring. And several of them involved in earthquake and tsunami. Wow. And as a result of this, he made 12 recommendations about things that they could change at Fukushima 
to ensure that a catastrophic failure didn't occur. They made 11 of the 12 changes. The 12th change was moving the location of the backup generators to a higher level above sea level to make sure they weren't inundated by a tsunami. And that's exactly what happened and why they had a meltdown. Wow. It goes right to what you say is that when you look at these things, sometimes when I talk to people about things like pre-mortem, they say, oh, this is Monday morning quarterbacking. You know, anyone can look at a problem in the past and say, well, it would, you know, you could have avoided it by thinking like this. But what they don't see and what we've just been talking about is that oftentimes if you look, people did say this beforehand. Right. And so tools like pre-mortem, in my mind, are designed to help more people have these epiphanies beforehand so that they can at least not even necessarily change their plan, but at least be aware that this is something we should guard against. We should, we should watch for as we're moving forward and we should have a plan on how we're going to change our course if we encounter this. Right. So I think that's one of the the major functions of a pre-mortem is to provide that kind of liberation of of thinking so that you can surface these ideas. But another outcome of a pre-mortem, if you do it with your team, is to change the culture and to demonstrate and to start living a culture of candor where people aren't uh, as afraid to voice unpopular ideas. When we run a pre-mortem, after the people have written down what they think might have caused the catastrophe, we go around the room and we start with the leader. And the leader has to always comes up with a showstopper that's legitimate, that, that's not frivolous. And then other people come up with their ideas. And now that's a different culture than anybody has been used to in, in many of these teams where people are usually very afraid to say anything that might be unpopular. I love that, a culture of candor. That's so important. And when people ask us, what do we do as an organization? What does our company do? I I tell them we create truth-telling cultures, which is Mm -hmm. very much the same type of thing. And it really is, you know, it's something that I firmly believe is that companies, organizations, whether companies, governments, militaries, they have the answers. There's people in the organizations who know exactly what needs to be done. It's the tendency that we have too often to kind of seek refuge in comforting lies or delusions that prevent us from seeing those answers, I think. Mm-hmm. Right. And people become pregnant with the plan yep. and it's very hard to change that. So when you talk to leaders, Gary, and they say, you know, what can I do to make a better decision? Besides things like shadow box, which I will recommend people check out and besides things like pre-mortem that I also really recommend people check out. What is just some basic advice you give to leaders and to decision makers about how they can make better decisions? For me, it boils down to trying to build an experience base and build richer mental models and to learn as much as is practical. I don't want to say as much as possible because that's not realistic, but as much as possible about events that have occurred instead of saying, well, this was a mistake. Let's make sure we don't make it again to say, well, this was a mistake, but we have good people here and they've made this mistake. Let's instead of being critical and impatient, to become curious instead of critical. It's really a change of mindset and to wonder, how do we go down this path? What beliefs did we hold that maybe we're getting in our way? And to use those as opportunities to build richer mental models rather than to have a a more punitive arrangement where people are starting to hide their mistakes We see this in medicine, in nuclear work with nuclear power plants, where people talk about having zero tolerance for errors. And it turns out that when you do research, zero tolerance for errors usually winds up leaving you less safe rather than more because people know that they've got to hide their errors. And instead of being candid about them and instead of learning from them, They're now trying to deflect blame or to make sure that people don't discover uh, what went wrong. So I think there's a fundamental mindset shift that's needed if leaders really want to develop their mental models and the mental models of the people in their organizations. Well, it's really about embracing the truth, right? It goes back to your culture of candor. And, you know, I think about Al Mulally, who we've had on the show, and his whole focus of his management system, of his BPR process is about surfacing the truth and about honestly celebrating people who are able to stand up and say, I have a problem. There is a problem in this part of the company. Can I get help to solve it? Mm -hmm. 
and to look at why did this happen, not in a, a way of assigning blame or like you say, you know, in a punitive way, but like, wow, that's really an important learning that we could all benefit from. Let's take a look at it, figure out how this happened, how we can avoid it and how we can help our teammate here get through this because that will make our whole organization better. So it's really about having, again, like you said, a culture of candor and a willingness to learn, to being a learning organization. Mm -hmm. So I would a culture of curiosity as well. Fascinating. This is wonderful stuff. Gary, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. It's, it's been a pleasure. I've always enjoyed talking with you, Bryce. I hope this has been useful. Thank you for listening to the Thinking Leader Podcast, sponsored by Red Team Thinking. To subscribe to Bryce's free newsletter, visit his website, brycehoffman.com. And don't forget to follow Bryce on social media. You can find him on LinkedIn and Twitter at Bryce Hoffman, all one word. That's B-R-Y-C-E-H-O-F-F-M-A-N. And to learn more about Bryce's company, Red Team Thinking, visit us at redteamthinking.com.